Spring is in the air. It's time to take care of the equipment that helps us live the lifestyle we lead. And that's what I'm going to show you in this video. But this is not going to be a how do you take care and do mechanics things. We're going to talk history. We're going to talk about the importance of keeping things running so that you can live the off-grid lifestyle. But more importantly, I'm going to throw shade at all the Unimog owners that are out there because a lot of people hate this incarnation of the vehicle. And, and really, truly, this is the peak of evolution on this train of engineering. And it is the perfect vehicle for living the off-grid lifestyle. So if you're into history or you want to learn about Unimogs and maybe help us fix some things along the way, join us for the rest of this episode. All right, so what is the genesis of the Unimog? So um, after World War II, you know, the Germans, we kind of didn't let them build machines of war, right? Uh, for good and obvious reasons. Um, but they had made a tractor that was really, truly amazing. Um, but essentially, after the World War II, um, they doubled down on continuing to build this chassis. And if you're a Unimog fan, everybody hears about the Unimog 404. And that was, they made probably a million or more of those vehicles. And it was run by um, a little uh, gasoline engine. And it was the predecessor to these modern chassis and these modern vehicles. This chassis, so just the part, let's not talk about the attachments that are on there or anything else. Just the actual machine itself is based on that 404 design that comes back after World War II. And this is the upgraded chassis, it's called the 419. So you can think about this as the Unimog 419. They only made 2,800 of these chassis, plus all the attachments that are on there. <clears throat> all right, one of the first things that we gotta do, let's just do a pre-walk around the vehicle and look at some of the problems we gotta address. This is a leaking hydraulic fluid. Um, when I was moving the shipping container, uh, I'll put a card up right here so that you can go ahead and see that video. Um, <clears throat> but there's these are flow control valves and shutoffs for disconnecting the front of the Unimog. Um, these valves broke, and I ordered a couple of replacements for them. Um, new old stock off of eBay. Uh, but you can see that there's a lot of leakage here. We got to fix that up. We don't like to have leaks going on. Let's see what other problems we got. All right, another task. This is not the standard fitting. When I was, again, moving the shipping container, uh, I couldn't get um, the original, um, I'll call them military grade connectors um, easily. Uh, I only I had to deal with things at the tractor supply store. So I'm gonna change these fittings back and I found a source to get the original fitting. So we're gonna do that. We got leaking hydraulic clamp cylinders. These hold the backhoe in position when you're doing work. You can see on the ground here, a lot of drips and things from that. We gotta clean that up. Another problem we have, if you look up on top of here, you can see all of this hydraulic fluid here. That's coming from this cylinder. So I think we're gonna have to address that as well. The fuel tank had all kinds of problems trying to figure out where I was getting air into the system. And uh, during that process, I can disconnect and connect to things. We're gonna put the fuel tank back to where it needs to be, get that mounted correctly. And I think we're just gonna go ahead and loop the chassis and, and do all kinds of things. So a lot of stuff that we have to do to take care of on the machine. In the United States, the tractors that we use you're gonna be familiar with. They have two large wheels on the rear and a narrow set of wheels in the front. And it was designed that way to um, drive between the rows in your field. Um, and that design actually goes way back to Lamborghini. No kidding. Uh, they were a tractor manufacturer at the turn of the century. And when the Germans looked at that design, they said, you know, we can do better. Why don't we do a four wheel tractor? And if we were gonna do that, we'd get better stability. And the ultimate thing we could do with it is to get as high off the ground as we can. And what they invented, what was called a portal axle. The way that 
a normal axle works is you have this very large set of gears in this pumpkin looking thing. And there's a drive shaft that comes from the engine and it gets the, the that drive shaft that's rotating gets turned 90 degrees to deliver power to each one of your wheels. And when you do that, you have a big, there's a big set of ring gears in here. So you have this huge housing and your ground clearance between here and here, it's only five or six inches, right? Like that's, you know, fine for street driving, but if you wanted a tractor and there's rocks in your field and all those things, it's not a good design having this so close to the ground. As the power is delivered to the wheel, it comes straight out of the back of the differential and it goes into the hub on your wheel and it just spins. What a portal axle does is, is it puts another gearbox inside or at the end of your differential and that lifts the whole pumpkin off the ground. So let's go take a look on the Unimog, what that design looks like and how it lifts this section off the ground. We have the same design. There's a pumpkin right here. This is your differential and it takes the power and drives it through. It looks like it's the other, it looks like it's this, it's sideways from the other one. Is that true or? What do you mean sideways? Uh, well, the other one looked like it was facing like the, the round part was oh, facing the front. I mean, this is just a case design oh, okay. so that this is, you can take this apart. The other one is just a big welded member. And honestly, this is a better design because you can unscrew and take apart the entire axle. Whereas on a normal straight axle, it's one big welded chunk. So this is a modular unit, but this is still just a differential. The power comes in from the engine. It turns that to 90 degrees. It runs through this axle tube. And this is what's called your portal box. So instead of this tube, going directly into the wheel, it hits another gearbox. And this gearbox, so there's a gear at the end and there's a gear down here that drives into the wheel. And the net effect of that is, is the whole body gets lifted up. In addition, you can change the gear ratio here so you can get much better drive. But here's what's really cool about this. Look at the underneath the vehicle. Just look at all that room. And that's the magic of portal axles. And that's why Unimogs are incredible. This is ground clearance. It helps you get, this is exactly the best design for a tractor, right? You have all of this room, you can drive over any terrain. And the design turned out to be so much better than just a tractor that it turned into a vehicle people would drive on the road. It became a great work truck. It could be a tractor. It became a universal machine. And that's where Unimog comes from. Universal Moto Garat. And I don't know what that means in German, but <laughs> I was just <laughs> Yeah, I have no idea. But but it's universal. That's the key. Unimog. It is a universal workhorse machine. And if you're gonna live off grid, that's what you need. So you'll notice that the rear is moving, but not the front. All right, this is gonna be a good opportunity to talk about one of the features on, on the Unimog. And one of the things about this vehicle is it has air actuated controls for the drive system. And until the air pressure builds up, you can't engage the locking mechanism. So this drives just like a car on the street without air pressure. All right, so we're just sitting here waiting for air pressure to build up. And now you can see we have enough air pressure that enabled my lockers. This is the locker light. And basically it says you're in four wheel drive and I'm gonna put power to every wheel all the time. Nothing, no fancy differentials that allow to slip and get you better handling on the road. Cause well, we're off road. We want all the grip we can get. So we're in that mode now. Let's go ahead and take a look at how much better she drives. This chassis was born 
as being a better tractor. And during World War, after World War II, when we demilitarized Germany, they had to focus on industrial uses for their manufacturing arm, right, to keep their economy going. And Mercedes-Benz is the manufacturer of this chassis. And they started to make this incredible universal machine that could be a heavy hauler. I've seen these things, these chassis converted to be fire trucks. In this case, we have a front bucket that's put on to the, the, the chassis so we can lift dirt. We also have a backhoe, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but the idea is, is you can put all kinds of different extensions on this thing to make it work. And now we got to fast forward kind of like geopolitically, right? So Mercedes-Benz makes this really incredible tractor, chassis, truck chassis, and it is the pinnacle of on-road and off-road performance. Now, what was happening at the time, uh, this is going to be 1988. The big military strategy at that point in time was called Reforger. And the idea was, is, hey, we were worried about the Soviet Union running a tank battle and just driving over all of Europe. That was what all the military industrial powers were worried about. And it became, it would be over, how do you combat that problem, right? Um, one, the United States could have had a huge installation with our NATO partners in Germany. We could have had all of our people stationed there, millions of people just sitting around twiddling their thumbs, basically, as both a deterrent for that potential Soviet threat of the tanks coming through. You know, and, you know, really, that's expensive way to do it. So the military strategy at the time was let's let's take the economic drain that that is but still have that deterrent force so they came up with a strategy called reforger and the idea was is we actually had put thousands of tanks all over germany and they were staged in different places all over the place but our people our our, our humans who were you know our soldiers were here in the united states and everything that we did at the time was about how do we get our soldiers to Germany as fast as possible. And I don't know the exact stats on it, but it was somewhere within 24 hours or so, they wanted to be able to get all their people deployed to those in-place assets. And, and so that was what was driving military strategy at the time. And one of the issues is, is that you have to be able to fight tank war, to fight against tanks, is that you have to be able to put obstructions in their way, right? And so the United States and, in fact, militaries around the world have battalions of what they called combat engineers. And combat engineers, their job was to shape the battlefield to both slow down and deter the enemy and kind of, um, uh, they called them sappers, right? They would sap the strength out of them. So Weren't, for weren't you a uh, combat engineer? That's right. So, um uh, back in 1990, 91, um, I joined the United States Army. I chose in the Illinois Army National Guard, and I was a combat engineer. And I trained on this vehicle. And what we would do with that is we would use this to go out into a field. Um, and if it was a big, wide open area, you would dig what are called tank ditches. And a tank dish, ditch can both be a offensive um, tool or a defensive strategy. So if you make a ditch that's really steep, what happens is a tank will drive in, and they'll nose into that ditch, and they can't climb out of it. That's what this vehicle is designed to do. You could go into this wide open field, you could use the backhoe, you could dig huge steep ditches to stop the advancement of tanks. And so what that would mean is the tanks would see these, they'd have to go into a certain route or they would have to alter the way they traveled. And then our military could then have their weapons sighted onto the pathway that we were steering the enemy to. And you could basically set up, um, if you want to think about it as, um, um, what's that word, baby, when you like, um, when you you sucker somebody to come in and you, uh. you know, it's a trap, but it's a, there's a word for that. I can't think of the word. <laughs> um, I keep thinking serpentine, but I don't think that's no, right. No, it's um. There's a word. 
Anyway. I can't think of it. Sorry. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll not worry about it. So, so anyway, that's what this vehicle was made for. Um, and the other issue was the need to be able to do convoy speeds, right? So thinking back, back to Ro the Reforger, you're getting all of your people deployed to an area, and you had to be able to position them quickly to react to how an enemy would be coming at you. And you think, well, why didn't America just use good old-fashioned American technology like Case or John Deere or something? Well, all of those backhoe platforms could only go 20 miles an hour max. And the entire strategy of Reforger was is getting from point A to point B as fast as you can, getting into place and being ready for battle. And so the military put out to bid and said, hey, we need a vehicle that can do all the digging to make ditches and, and do all the combat engineering things we need, but it needs to travel fast. The only chassis that could do that was this, was the Unimog chassis. And so a contract was put out and because of the way the American procurement system works, you gotta buy American, right? And so they bought this from Freightliner and Freightliner put out the bid and they partnered with Mercedes-Benz. They bought the chassis. They added Case 5. I'm sorry, this is a Schutt and Schmidt, which is a manufacturer of a bucket in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So good old American bucket in the front. And if we go around to the rear, this piece is just a Case 580 backhoe that folds up onto the chassis for rapid movement down the road. So the whole point of this vehicle was to be able to go in be a superb engineering vehicle and be able to travel fast at those convoy speeds. Now there's a couple of issues with that, right? Um, convoy speed of 50 miles an hour. This vehicle weighs 16,000 pounds in this configuration. It has an OM352 diesel. That's the Mercedes Benz inline six diesel. It only makes 110 horsepower. So, you have 110 horsepower trying to push 16,000 pounds down the road at 50 miles an hour. The reality of it is on a good day with a tailwind, maybe going slightly downhill, you could sustain 35 miles an hour or so um, with this vehicle. So I think it comes up short in that area. Um, but but that was the whole point of, of this vehicle. So they made 2,800 of these things. And... Um, as a young man, when I was in the army, I trained on these things. I fell in love with them and I realized how just useful they were for that terrain. And it just made sense for us to have one here in, in the mountains because it was made for, think about the topography of, of, of Germany and that Russian border, lots of trees. You need good mobility to get in between them, but still have to do your digging. And that's perfect for the mountains of Colorado. All these trees are tight packed together. That's really good cover. And for us off grid, we don't want to destroy the environment. We want to be able to work around them. And so having a small, tight vehicle that can get into those nooks and crannies and still do the work you need it to do, this is literally the perfect off grid platform. Good thing it's fast, Ray. <clears throat> I'm trying to get. Ooh. Oh, yay! You did it! Pull it back. Pull it, pull it, pull towards you, the bucket. There you go. Good job. Yum. All right, why don't we get you a towel now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that'd be nice, huh? All right, let's unfold the back though and show you how that goes, because this is like the transformer of all vehicles. So there are two hydraulic systems on this Unimog. The first one is driven off of the engine, and the second one is driven off of a PTO-driven pump. So you use the engine driven pump to unfold the bucket and then the PTO driven pump drives the, the backhoe. What does so, the PTO stand for? Power takeoff. Okay. So the engine driven hydraulic pump is 8 gallons per minute. The power takeoff driven pump is 26 gallons per minute. So it's much bigger and you can move this equipment. So, okay, step one. There's a travel lock at the top that we have to undo this lever. We're going to idle up the machine. And now I'm going to make sure that the lock cylinders are up. So, so we want them in the up position.
the controls you need to operate the vehicle are actually back here. So I can idle it up with the flick of the switch to get full engine power. I can also raise and lower the front bucket from here. One of the things that's really kind of a, a challenge with this vehicle is that you cannot swivel your chair from the backhoe to the front of the vehicle. You have to actually get off of the backhoe, climb into the front cabin and move the vehicle. We're on like a Pace 580 platform. You can just swivel your chair around, drive it where you want to. But there is a way you can get around that. What I've done is taken the bucket and I jam it into the ground. So with that front bucket down, it acts as a brake. And so I can use the backhoe to pull or push me forward if I'm digging a trench in a straight line. And it's a little awkward, but it works. Let's show you how that's done. One of the things about being like a fast and mobile like reaction force is, is you need to have your engineers that could be self-contained. So there'll be two guys assigned to this vehicle and all the tools that you need to do your job are here. And so we have, for example, our tool rolls and all the tool kits that we need, everything you need to fix it. But also you have a whole set of what are called engineering tools. They call them pioneer kits actually. And Why do they call them pioneer kits? Well, think about like um, pioneers in the old west. Okay. You would go out into All an area, would you would need everything that a pioneer would need. So okay. you have a chainsaw. So one of the things you do for, if you're an engineer, what you want to do is you would do these things. There, I think they were called abattoirs. What you would do is on a road, if you wanted to slow down the enemy, mm -hmm. what you could do is cut trees. So if you have a road, you could cut the trees and they would fall one on top of each other, just on top of that road. Oh. Really, it's a pain in the ass to clean it up. I got you. And so if you were retreating and you wanted to slow down the enemy, you would just chop trees and have them fall one on top of each other on top of the road. Chainsaw. Right? Let's say you needed to build a bunker. Mm -hmm. You would quick chop down some big trees, dig a hole, put your logs over the top, cover it with dirt, and now it's safe and you can put a place in for your... For your for your folks but for us off grid we can just go drive out find a bunch of deadfall we can go and buck and treat so again born from the military perfect off grid there's other tools here check this out okay now well, i got my oil i'm a good engineer so i got everything i can i need to be able to take care of my equipment <laughs> and so i have um let's see uh excuse me i've got my torque wrench Right, gotta have that. Um, I have a hydraulic impact driver. Yeah. That is awesome. And that cool? It's an ugga dugga, but <laughs> hydraulic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and let me unbolt this. So all these things plug in. Yeah, they plug in. We'll show you what that looks like on the other side. All right, let me get my other tools out. I have a uh, set of impact sockets, of course. Right, I should be able to, you gotta think about it this way. You gotta be able to fix your machine if it breaks down, right? You're an engineer, right? Fix that stuff. All right, so the next thing you got is a hydraulic impact drill. So you can drill into rocks. Why do you need to drill into rocks? Well, engineers also did explosives. So you would drill a hole into the rock. You could place your explosives and boom, you're on the rope. You're on the way. The other thing, this one's really heavy. This is heavy, heavy. I know. There we go. This. 
Jackhammer. It's a jackhammer. And so you could boom, 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 boom. Yeah, all of these equipment was Stanley equipment. So because this stuff's all hydraulic, it's what you can do with it. Runs underwater. Oh. Right? Like there's no motors on all this stuff. Oh. You just run underwater. So you have all the things that you need to do engineering work. So we've used this. What was the first job we did with the Unimog when we got here? Bridge. We made a bridge. That's what other combat engineers do. We make bridges, right? So all the tools you need to build a bridge, all here contained. Um, Especially this one right there. The what tool? The tool in your brain. Yeah, the tool in your brain, <laughs> right? You're, that's an important tool. That's an important tool. Okay, so here's the tools. And then inside of your engineer pioneer kit here is, you know, for example, if you wanted to break up heavy ground, you could put this blade into your jackhammer, right? You have for um, drilling into rock for the hammer drill. That's a big, isn't that, that is you see? Fantastic. Yeah, and you see these little carbide tips there? Yeah. Okay, so where are we gonna use this? Uh, in more building the foundation. Yeah, I'm gonna use this to drill through. Rebuilding the foundation. When we rebuild the foundation on the new cabin, I'm gonna drill holes with this. We're gonna put bolts through. Okay. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then you can get extensions for this so we can go as long as we want to. Yeah. But but that's the pieces. Do you have to get different sizes of that? You can. So, all right. Just so you know, on big trucks, you got to have big tools. So I have a bag here of all my super big, cute wrenches. Oops. Oh, that hurt. And um, let's see. Okay. If we need the smaller size. Oh, thanks, Boof. I just want to say, that's. That's as big as my arm. Yeah, <laughs> right, because you got to, <laughs> bolts are hard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but here, here's a smaller bit. Oh, okay. You see? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I just got dirty. Oh, uh, I did you well. Uh, that's good. Here we go. Not a good day unless you get dirty. That's right. So let's see what other good you've got in here. Um, and then I actually have a bunch of different things that I keep in here. Um, little bars and... These are like my rock hammers. These are old bits that we found here on the gold mine that we can use to pry and do things with. So just basically a you know, big hammer um, and convincers. So everything that you need on your off-grid projects is right here in this one vehicle. So that's why it's important we got to take care of it because it's how we're going to survive. So let's go take a look at maybe how this stuff hooks up. I also, I also love how you could tell that it was originally the army green and then they painted it for probably desert Ormond. Well, they? actually, that's exactly what happened was. So remember, reforgers going on and we were worried about the tank war. And, and I'll be honest with you, it quickly became apparent the tank warfare died. Right. Tank warfare is it's an old school yeah. thing with modern technology. You could just do laser weapon, yeah. you know, laser guided weapons on it. So you don't need it. So what happens with Desert Storm, they're like, oh shit, we have all this equipment that's painted green for Germany. And so, yeah, so they would have, when they deployed to um, uh, go over to, uh, to, yeah, to Kuwait and to do uh, Desert Storm, Desert Shield, your, your job as an engineer, first thing was, is get your vehicle all packed up. You had to tape it off yourself and you went through these paint booths, basically. You drove it through, they and they painted these things in like, you know, 20 minutes or whatever. Um, oh, let's talk about paint. This is cool. You see that? What does that say? Kark. Kark. Chemical agent resistive coating. Uh -huh. okay. So this Kark paint, the way that this was designed was, is you wanted to have chemical, nasty chemical warfare things, neuro agents, all that stuff, right? Well, if that was in the battlefield, they didn't want it to stick. So the coating on here, even though it's it feels rough and it looks, yeah. I think it'll actually have droplets of any oily material. It doesn't stick to it. Oh. So you laying that stuff down is really nasty, and you got to wear a respirator and all that. But um, it's it's one. It's like a durable epoxy coating. So you can see. Let me just show you areas on the vehicle here. You can see how. No matter how hard you use this thing, like it takes forever to wear it off. Oh. 
yeah. and it's just a really durable epoxy paint. When you sand it, it could get into your lungs. So you have to, you want to make sure you're wearing a respirator and stuff. Sure. But the paint on here was designed again for military uses, but it turns out to keep a vehicle really well preserved. Um, I mean, this vehicle was what? It was, it was built in 88 and it's 2024. So how old is this? 98. Yeah, it's they're almost 50 years, right? Well, 20, 40, 40 some, almost 50 years old. This is the only rust, a little bit of rust there. Um, like these are the military grade. So anyway, that was paint. The paint on here, kark, good stuff. All right, you wanna grab the chainsaw? 36. What's that, 36, 36 years? You wanna grab the chain, grab that chainsaw, boo? Okay. All right, now I got this fired up. Let's go ahead and just show you how the accessories work. Um, we'll just go ahead and pop on the Ugga Dugga for right now. We got maintenance to do on the chainsaw. And right now it's not gonna spin because you have to idle up the engine and then there's a solenoid that'll divert power to it. So it's gonna get loud, but here we go. Now, anywhere we want to on the vehicle. Well, ain't that a bummer? Check this out. Get glasses. What are we looking at? You see this? That's all yeah. pitted. I think that's rested in the leather. I mean, I'm not a hydraulics expert. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure that's no good. No. I probably should have inspected this a little bit better before we spent all that time pulling it. But look at that. The chrome on the cylinder is bad. And I think I think that's no good because even if I replace the seal, even if that was smooth, those little pits will tear it up and it's just no good. <sighs> well, let's go check the cylinder on the other one first and see if it if it's good. Okay. And then uh, we can see. It's still good practice, though. Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, I'm, being that I've never done this, I usually take them to a hydraulic shop. I mean, this one's great. Look at that. Yeah. Nice and shiny all the way through. Yep. So maybe that's what we'll do. I'll use that one as practice to take it apart. Yep. And then just once I'm good at that, I'll quick yank this off. That way we're not out of service for, like, a long time. Right. Okay? We can't afford that. Yeah. All right. He has to be working. He does. All right. Well, hey, Boo, thanks for changing the oil today. And um, we still got to lube this guy up. And uh, um, I got to still finish putting the gas tank back on. Oh, Let's yeah. See. Yeah. yeah. I cut those pieces for it, but now we just got to get the straps back on. Um, also, let me just show the folks at home. I had done some fuel routing where the return was going in this old whiskey bottle. Now that I know my air leaks are done, I'm going to get rid of that and properly plumb it back into the return gas lines here. So more work to do, but you know, if uh, the ground is melting, it's looking to be spring and, uh, let's get the, yeah, let's do all of our maintenance now so that we can tackle that roof. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks babe. Thank you. Yeah.